say, first of all, that it's a great honor to be doing this conference and talking to all of you, and a great pleasure, too, to help uh, think with you about uh, curriculum in this modern world of global citizenship. And also, I want to make an apology at the beginning that I don't speak Spanish. I feel very ashamed about this. I spent my early life learning such things as Greek and Latin, and, and so, so, so I never actually learned Spanish, and I'm embarrassed about that. But uh, in any case, I'm very, very happy that some of my books have been translated into Spanish, and particularly that this book on education has been. So let me tell you why I wrote this book on education. In the middle 1990s in the US, we were having lots of debates about what the undergraduate liberal arts curriculum should be. In other words, what courses should all undergraduates take together as a general preparation for citizenship and life? And our debates were often very divisive. There were some people who were saying, oh, we should only learn the great books, the old books of our tradition that have been famous for a long time. And then other people were saying, well, no, because we live in a new world now. And we live in a world where we have to get along together and be able to talk well to people from different groups within our own nation, racial minorities, the concerns of women have to be represented, concerns of, of all kinds of different groups within our society we have to be able to talk about and understand. But then also we live in a world that's interactive. And it's very easy for people from the United States to walk into the world thinking all they need to know is about America. And uh, of course that's not correct. Or if, if people go into the world debates with that attitude, they will be arrogant and they will not listen, and they really won't be able to achieve mutual understanding. So the question that I pose to myself is, what could we learn from just thinking about this question? What should everyone know if they're going to be an effective citizen, not just of one nation, but of the whole world in this time where we really have to think well together if we are going to achieve any progress on the issues that are of most importance to us, issues about the environment, about human rights, about global justice more generally, the role of women in a global society, the role of racial, ethnic, and cultural minorities. So all of these are issues that we are not going to solve unless we talk together and talk together with adequate preparation to be good listeners and good contributors to that kind of debate. Now, I focus in the book on the humanities, and I do it partly because I, I am from the humanities. My own training is in classical literature and art and also in philosophy. But I also wanted to focus on the humanities because I think everyone agrees that science is very important for global citizenship. And everyone agrees that somehow economics is important. But often, the humanities are not part of that debate. And I think what happens when the humanities are not part of that debate is that it's a very impoverished debate. I myself have been very involved with the effort to promote what's called the human development perspective in international discussion about development with uh, 1998 Nobel Prize winner Amartya Sen. I've been one of the pioneers of the capabilities approach to international development, which is an approach that draws insights from the humanities about the quality of a human life and uses those insights to correct the narrow and defective approaches of traditional economics. So I'm a real passionate advocate for the humanities. And I think we don't get an adequate account of what a human life is and what it might be to improve the quality of a human life if, if people aren't educated in the humanities, in literature, art, and philosophy, as well as in science and economics. So that's the part I'm going to focus on. But I think we have to focus on it, because it's that part that's often left out. And it's uh, mocked, even, as being useless, as merely empty frills, and so on. So in the book, I argue that there are actually three abilities that an education in the humanities should cultivate. 
and that all of these are essential for good global citizenship. First is what Socrates called the examined life. That is the ability to challenge your own traditions, to look through and into your habits, not just to be an unthinking continuer of a tradition or of a habit, but to challenge what your parents have taught you, to ask why, and to ask, do we have good reasons for the ways that we actually do things? So Socratic teaching takes the beliefs that we all hold dear, and it asks what lies behind them, what reasons we have for them. And then, of course, we can have a dialogue with each other that's richer. So Socratic thinking not only cultivates the inner life of each person, making you richer because you've asked, why should I stand for this? Is this really me? But we also then can talk to each other better because instead of just saying, well, this is what I think, and this is what you think, we can say, well, you know, this is why I think this, but what are your reasons for what you think? And then we can have a dialogue that's a real dialogue instead of just trading claims and counterclaims like on US talk radio, we always have that way of talking to each other. Instead of that, we can actually think together. Um, I interviewed one student for the book who said that before he had his critical thinking course in philosophy, he actually didn't know that you could think about the arguments that supported positions that are different from your own. And he was absolutely astonished when he was assigned to argue in favor of limiting the death penalty, because he actually believed in the death penalty. And he didn't know what it was to actually think about what the reasons were against the death penalty. But he said that gave him a completely new attitude to political debate, that suddenly it became something about reasons and about listening to the other side and thinking, well, maybe there are some reasons that we share, uh, some things about human dignity that we might have in common that will help us talk well uh, across these divisive issues. So that's the first part. And I think that part is usually best cultivated by courses in philosophy, where we really do pursue Socrates' challenge to lead the examined life. And often we might do it by reading Plato's wonderful dialogues, because I think that's a very good starting point for critical thinking of all kinds. But we'll want also to think about issues of our own time. Some of the best classes I know think about political speeches, and they look for the logic behind those speeches. Are there logical errors in this political speech or in this newspaper editorial? And uh, then they move on to debates about issues of the day. So that kind of class, which often goes on then to just study major approaches to justice, to the foundations of ethics, that is what would fulfill the first part of my requirement. And I think that's really crucial for global citizenship because otherwise democracy is not going to work very well. Socrates himself lived in a democracy where people just made boasts and claims. And he said that he was like a gadfly on the back of a noble but sluggish horse. Uh, the horse was the Athenian democracy, that he was stinging it to wake it up so it could do its own business more in a more wide awake way, in a more reasonable way. So that's what I think philosophy contributes to global citizenship. The second part of my proposal is the ability to think as a citizen of the whole world, not just as a citizen of some local region or group. Now, this is very broad, and it requires a lot of things. But in particular, it requires a lot more learning than our students used to get about the rest of the world. I mean, when I first went to an international institute run by the United Nations, I knew nothing about any religion other than Christianity and Judaism. I knew nothing about Buddhism, Islam, Hinduism, the other major world religions. And I knew very little about the history of non-Western cultures and civilizations. I didn't know very much about minorities within my own culture. So this part of the curriculum really means developing effective courses that give the student that kind of basic information. Now, of course, you can't learn everything you need to know. So what you need to do is to learn some things in depth and then learn how to inquire 
more generally about unfamiliar cultures. So what I suggest is that all students must learn the basic rudiments of the major world religions, which I think is so crucial now for global understanding. It should be possible for every citizen to have a knowledge of Islam that's more than a set of simplistic cliches, to know the internal diversities and debates within each religion, but then to have some very basic understanding of global history and the histories of non-Western cultures and traditions as well as one's own, and then to have some examples of how to inquire in more detail into one unfamiliar tradition. So here, the university might think about its own resources. Some universities will be strong in the teaching of Chinese and Japanese traditions. Some might be stronger in the teaching of South Asian traditions. So drawing on your own resources, you can think, what kind of more specialized knowledge will students get? Now, of course, some students will learn about India, and they'll go ahead and they'll be working in China. But it doesn't matter in a way, because you've learned how to inquire. You've learned what questions you need to ask about the enormous differences in family traditions, traditions of political debate, traditions of academic development in a different culture. Then, further, you need to think about the minorities within your own culture. In the case of the United States, that means a particular focus on the history of slavery and the history of the role played by people of African descent in the American democracy. And so I think all students should have a course that focuses on race if they're in the United States. Now, you know, in other cultures, you've got to really think, what are the minorities that you're particularly likely not to understand? And then focus on that. Uh, native peoples would be one example. What are the problems of indigenous minorities? And what are their cultural contributions? What are their histories of suffering and inequality? And then I think in pretty much every country, there need to be courses that focus on the achievements and the struggles of women. Because even though they're everywhere in the curriculum, traditionally, they're nowhere. Because history has traditionally been taught with a focus on political history, Literature has often been taught with a focus on the achievements of men. And so you have to start thinking about what have women contributed to the culture and what are their problems. I would like every class to learn the basic data about women's education all over the world, the tremendous inequalities in educational opportunities for women in different parts of the world, the inequalities in basic health and life chances. So knowing something about those struggles all over the world, but then focusing in on your own culture. And finally, I think it's very important for an undergraduate curriculum to include responsible discussion of sexuality and sexual minorities. Because we all have deeply held feelings about sex. We all belong to traditions. We, many of us belong to religions that have deeply held views about that. But we also need a responsible public debate about issues like contraception, abortion, homosexuality. Now, here it's often very difficult. And, and there will be often very divisive debates about what it means to include teaching on these extremely sensitive issues in an undergraduate curriculum. But I think historical understanding can always be very, very valuable. I think it's very helpful to teach the history of Greek homosexuality when you're approaching this divisive issue, because then it's a culture that's quite far away, so you don't have to face your own modern issues right away. But you can also see that an intelligent civilization has actually had views that are very different from some of the prevailing modern views. So that can be one very helpful way of approaching a divisive topic. So all of that is the second part of the proposal. Then the third is what I call the narrative imagination. This means the ability not just to know a whole bunch of facts about history and other cultures, but the 
development of the imaginative ability to think what it's actually like to be in the shoes of a person different from yourself, to take on in your imagination some of the emotions, some of the thoughts that a person so placed might have. And I think that's an essential complement to the second part and indeed to the first part because you don't get any kind of adequate citizenship unless you have an imagination. When you meet somebody who's different, if you're always thinking, oh, well, that's someone who's different from me, then you're not going to have a good dialogue with that person, no matter how much you know. But it's only if you have this generous spirit of imagination, where you can put yourself in that person's shoes and think, well, what was the experience of that person's ancestors under slavery? What's the experience now of a African-American man who walks into a grocery store and finds that everyone is holding on to their purse, thinking that that must be a thief over there. You know, so that imaginative ability is cultivated above all through courses in literature and the other arts. Ralph Ellison, the great African-American writer, wrote a novel, which I hope you know in Mexico, called Invisible Man. He wrote it in the 1950s, and it was about an African-American man who really couldn't be understood by the white civilization around him because they didn't cultivate their inner eyes. And he said he was invisible to them, not because of his own dark skin, but because of the blindness of their own inner eyes. Well, the novel itself was meant to be a cultivation of the inner eyes of the reader. And Ellison said that a novel like that could be what he called a raft, a boat, of perception hope and entertainment that could help us get over some of the snags and whirlpools that lay between us and the democratic ideal. So he's thinking of democracy as a float on a very difficult river, and novels can be boats that can help us get through the currents of that river and get to the other side somehow because of the way in which they work on the inner eyes. Well, I think there are very many different ways in which courses in literature and the other arts can do this. Uh, and sometimes they work best if they take very classical, highly general works of literature. In thinking about the suffering of people who are excluded, I think there's no more powerful work in the world than Sophocles' drama Philoctetes about the sufferings of somebody who's been excluded because he smells bad, he has a disfiguring disease, and one can use a verse drama like that as a jumping off point to talk about all kinds of different issues of exclusion. But sometimes, too, you're going to want to choose works that it deal more concretely with the struggles of particular minorities in your own country or in other countries that you especially might deal with obtusely and blindly. So I do think that, of course, that acquaint students with Ellison's great novel, has a specific value in addition to a course that would treat Sophocles and Aeschylus and other classic writers. Uh, so we have to think very creatively about how to construct courses that are both very general and, and very concrete, including works that deal with the struggles of women and other uh, excluded groups in our society, also dealing with other cultures. And I often like students, even in my law classes, to read short stories, for example, by the uh, Bengali writer Mahasweta Devi, who writes about poor women in West Bengal, in India. And what's the daily life of such a woman like? Because a story like that can promote a much more adequate confrontation with development issues than just reeling off a whole sort of set of facts about the lives of poor women. Because now the student can actually start however difficult it is, start to put herself in the place of that woman with all the differences in her life. And then she's one step closer, anyway, to having an adequate dialogue with people from a different culture. So I think I'll stop the introduction at this point and start having some questions. OK. I'll try to, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm like, <laughs> sorry. OK. Um, uh, well, we will be waiting. Uh, 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 questions from the audience in Mexico, but I will start asking some questions. Uh, your late uh, your work on emotions. Critical thinking is good for any citizen, but can tolerance be achieved just by critical thinking? 
What about emotions? What else is it needed? Well, see, I think critical thinking is very important, but emotional understanding is also very, very important. And that's why I have this third part, really. I mean, the, I used the word imagination just mm -hmm. now, but of course, what you get by reading a novel of Ellison is much more than just intellectual imagination, but it's emotionally rich. And you find that if you study a film or you study a poem and so on, yeah, you are cultivating your inner emotional life. And, and that is really crucial. Uh, there are many, many emotions you need to understand. You need to understand, of course, the anger that excluded people feel. And you need, um, but you need also to activate your own faculty of sympathy and um, common fellow feeling. So there are many different emotions that you need to think well about. And you'll also want to understand emotions that are not so pleasant, like disgust and stigma. You'll want to see why it is or how it is that people express disgust toward other people. And they stigmatize them. That's what my book, Hiding from Humanity, mm -hmm. is about. And you don't begin to see why that's problematic in political life until you see some examples of, of, of how people do that. OK. One more question, and then we will go to Monterey, where Barbara Petz will start asking questions. Uh, you talk about minorities. You talk about women. And in your book, Cultivating Humanity, you talk about the prism of gender. Could you elaborate on that? I think that's very important, the way you see traditional yeah. um, ideas. Well, I think you know when you think about obstacles to understanding, uh, one of the most powerful obstacles is the gender line. Uh, think about the ancient Greeks who went to the theater and they saw plays about women who were raped in wartime and so on. That was a very difficult challenge to the democratic imagination because their democracies, uh, only males were citizens. And most of the people in that theater were men. But they were being asked by those plays to imagine the pain of a woman who's been raped. And I think. Um, Often that line is very difficult to cross. You know, if I find myself, I, I, I can think maybe what it might be like to be if I had been born in a different social class or I'd been born in a different race. But to think of yourself, your very own self, as different in gender is very, very, very difficult to do. And gender um, inflects every single part of a child's life from the moment that it's born. For example, we know from experiments that if the very same baby is labeled a, a female, people will treat it differently from if it's labeled a male. For example, if people think the little baby is a female, they will tend to be very protective and hold the child close and say, oh, poor thing, I must comfort her when she cries. If they think it's a boy, they'll be much more likely to bounce it in the air and say, oh, ho, ho, you know, and say, well, now he really, he's crying because he's angry and he wants to get what he wants. So knowing these things, I think we know that gender enters our lives in a very profound way, maybe even more profoundly than race or, or other differences, because it, it just affects how we're treated from the moment we're born. And so then to become aware of that, to become aware that we do that, to become aware of what the gender concepts of our society are, what parts of that we it might be a barrier to women's equality. All of that is what I mean by seeing mm -hmm. society through the prism of gender. OK. So um, well, we go to Monterey. Are you ready? We're ready. Hi. I have a question. It says, when liberal arts and humanities courses are included in the curricula of science and engineering programs, they only represent a small percentage. Thus. This type of students will only take a few credits in literature, a few in philosophy, and so on. Is there any sense? Sorry. Is there any sense in making science engineering students go through this, even if they just get a glimpse of arts and humanities? Oh yes, absolutely. I think there is a sense, and you know, in the U.S., we have a wide range of different practices on this. But some of the students that I describe in my book are, in fact, students who are going into business or into science and technology, 
And I think, you know, the more they can do, the better, obviously. Some of our universities, like Cornell University, have very demanding liberal arts requirements for all students, even in the ones who are in the separate agriculture school or in the separate ho school of hotel management and so on. Um, so the more, the better. But even if it's only a small proportion, it can, if it's done well, if it's done really creatively with the professors really thinking how to interact with the students, then it can change their lives. It can make them think differently about the issues that they confront because scientists are changing the world. So they better be able to think about the human beings that they're affecting with their policies. So yes, I think that thinking how to do that well is more important for science, scientists than it is for people who are going to go on and major in humanities and do a lot of that. Thank you. Okay, right. Professor Nussbaum, it's a pleasure to be in contact with you, even though it's through this electronic media. Uh, I wonder if you have something to tell us, a recommendation regarding the following. We live in Mexico in a society that, um, if we were to take someone's categories, like Karl Popper's categories, we would call it a closed society. That means that the Three ways that you offer to enhance the curricula of university faces with uh, a lot of challenges from the society. So I would like to ask you, you have recommendations for people, um, that is perhaps the case of many of, of our teachers here, that know that critical thinking may be opposed by society. So our students sometimes feel that, well, being critical is not going to be welcomed in the industries or in their family. So what would you do if you were in our situation in which you know that perhaps what you are trying to infuse in students, the critical thinking, may be, um, well, not, de yeah, risking, not that endangering their lives, but you know, maybe not uh, going to fare very well. And we know by history that the, the way that Socrates and other people have fared is not very um, well hopeful. Yeah, well, I mean, look, I don't think your situation is all that different from ours in this respect. I mean, you've, like, like Mexico, U.S. Uh, has a democratic structure, but at the same time, it's a very conservative society. And I mean, in, in our case too, parents are very frightened when kids go away to college and they really do think that the young people will be corrupted. It's very much like the old situation that Socrates was in when he had to defend himself on the charge that he was corrupting the young. Um, I do think that you have to try to listen to people who are worried and find out exactly what they're worried about. Now, I think often they're worried because they think, wrongly in my view, that people who think for themselves are irresponsible people, that they will somehow become selfish hedonists and they will run off and do whatever they please. That's indeed what the parents in Socrates' day thought too. And I think, you know, to those people you can say, look here, somebody's ethical life is never going to be stable if they do what they're told only because of habit and only because of tradition. But it's actually when they've learned to think it out for themselves and to find out what their deep reasons are for endorsing those ethical principles that they will be much more stable in life. And actually, that is a very time-honored Roman Catholic position. So if you're dealing primarily with Catholic parents who are saying that, I think you have very little resistance on that score because the major Catholic universities in the United States are the ones that are most promoting critical thinking. I mean, there's no other universities in America that require philosophy, but every single Jesuit university is requiring two semesters of philosophy, sometimes four semesters of philosophy. So I wrote a separate chapter, as you know, about liberal education in the religious traditions, because I thought that was especially interesting topic. But, but actually, the Catholic tradition was the one that gave 
least resistance. Uh, evangelical Protestants who really do think that there's an antithesis between reason and faith, who think that maybe even searching for reasons is getting into the vice of secular humanism. Those people are, are much diff more difficult in the United States to convince. Uh, but but I think, you know, you have the Roman Catholic tradition as a very powerful ally, and you can mine that tradition for voices that defend open-minded critical thinking in the university and just bring out those texts from, I mean, Dante is one very good one, and but there are many, many that you can find. And just say, look here, it's it's actually our tradition that, that faith and reason are complementary and that we want our moral lives to be lived on a secure foundation. And then I think you go on to say, look, we're all in a pluralistic society. There's no country now which is not pluralistic, that has a plurality of cultures, of races, of religions. And so for that reason, in addition, we need to be able to argue together and to find ways of speaking that aren't just habitual and aren't just traditional. So given the fact of pluralism in every modern country, we're, democracy will fail if we don't learn how to think critically and to talk together. Yes, in your book, Poetic Justice, you argue that reading literature can form a student's mind in an ethical way. But I, 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 I wish for you to give us more examples regarding that. How, how, how can that help the kids make ethical choices? Okay, sure. Um, now, in the book Poetic Justice, I, I had a slightly, it was related to what I say in Cultivating Humanity, but it was a, a slightly more specific question. It, it was about how uh, certain works of literature, works that obviously have to be selected, not just any work of literature would do this, can help cultivate faculties of sympathy and understanding that make someone a better participant in a jury or that make them a better judge. So I was focusing on this legal context, but I think you could broaden it to citizenship more generally. And the idea is that when you're reading a work of literature, let's say it portrays the suffering of someone who's excluded. So let me take Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man as an example now. You're not just learning some facts about the history of African Americans, but you're actually participating. The literary work invites you to identify with the leading character. And then you take on some of the experiences, some of the emotions, and you have those experiences inside yourself, so to speak. And you have a, a rich emotional life as if you were that character. And that is actually much more, it affects you more deeply than just learning some facts. It could be done some other way. A class of, for younger school children might have the children put on a play about slavery, and they might learn that way. So I think there are many ways of using the arts to enrich the imagination. But certainly, if you're dealing with older students you, and you have large classes, having them read one of these great novels is a, is a very powerful way of getting their imaginations into what it's actually like to be in the position of someone different from themselves. They could also learn this by interacting with students in the classroom who are different. And let's hope we will have pluralistic classrooms in the university. So at the same time as they're reading Ralph Ellison's novel, they'll ask the African-American student in that class, well, how did you feel when you read that? And then they might find out something further about the emotions that someone has who comes from that history and how they're different from their own. But uh, the first starting point of just having a richer emotional experience in connection with uh, the, the, the perception of someone who's different from you is I think it's a, a, an invaluable starting point for uh, cultivating a, a robust kind of understanding of a minority group that you're not a part of. And I should say maybe I think about this partly because of my own history and how narrow it was. You know, I came from a very privileged family. And it was a family that was from the so-called white Anglo-Saxon Protestant majority in the United States. I mean, I'm, my name wasn't Nussbaum in those days. I, I converted to Judaism later, but I, my name was Craven before that. And, you know, I lived in this very rich part of Philadelphia, 
in school, I only saw people who were Protestants and white and rich. But how did I learn about the differences that my society contained? Well, all summer long, I simply lay on my living room couch reading Dickens. And I read every novel of Dickens. And I learned something from that, not just about the fact that the world contains people who are not Protestant and rich and, and so on, but I, I learned it through the emotions, through the emotions of little Oliver Twist or Nicholas Nickleby or Smike, the disabled character in Nicholas Nickleby. And so, you know, these were my friends and I had a wide range of emotions in respect to them. And, and, and I actually think this was one of the best parts of my education. It's me again. It's just a question about class size. I wonder if this um, experience of uh, being in touch with um, teaching emotions or making students aware of their emotions, can that work with large classes? Do you have any opinion about the importance of personalized education or whether this sort of uh, education also works in large classes? Yeah, well, I, I used to always give my students an exam question that said, if um, Socrates or Aristotle or Epicurus, or I would name several, if they were here in the university, what kind of courses would they teach? And the students usually say, oh, well, he'd offer a lecture course on the examined life, or he'd do this or that. And they rarely got the point that actually all of them would have been quite horrified by the large class size that we have. They would have insisted on personalized instruction. Socrates never wrote anything uh, because he was so skeptical of the idea that ideas thrown out to everyone alike could do anything at all. But of course, we live in a society where we can't have personalized instruction, so we have to think of ways of challenging people, making them come alive in this larger format. I think one way has got to be through writing assignments that challenge students to think on their own, and then the professor has to really write a lot of comments on those writing assignments, and so that requires a certain kind of support for teaching assistance, for grading, and so on. But if you're teaching critical thinking to 100 people, you better have a lot of writing, and you better have people who are prepared to grade that writing with lots of useful comments, or else they're not going to learn anything. With the emotion part, it's also very important, sure. I mean, I think it's almost, it's a little bit easier to teach literature in a large class than it is to teach critical thinking, because, you know, with the critical thinking at each step, whether the argument is valid or invalid, you've got to ask them to be doing that all the time. Um, and they have to do it themselves. With literature, there's a little more that can go on in the private space of the student without their having to produce anything yet. Uh, so I think a good course in literature will challenge students to cultivate that private space, will give examples of powerfully intuitive and, and, and insightful reading that then they are challenged to replicate. Uh, I mean, you know how it is in a good class. I mean, very often students will be asked then to write their own interpretation of some passage or of a poem. And then, once again, if the class is large, there's still it, it, they've got to write comments on the papers. Because if they don't do that, then nothing has been learned at all. I mean, this is one reason I'm extremely skeptical of a lot of European higher education, because I think there's much too little feedback given to the student who's doing something from day to day. They have these cumulative exams at the end, and then they'll, you know, often the exams themselves are quite uh, routine. So, you know, how are they going to learn anything? In, in Norway, in the University of Oslo, they have a class, they've introduced a required class on ethics, but it's a class with 500 people, and they take a multiple choice examination at the end. Well, they might as well just not have done it. So it's only if you're prepared to organize things in such a way that there are people grading the writing, and preferably you break the larger lecture course down into smaller sections for discussion too. So let's say I have a course of 200 people, I would also have sections that have 20 people each, and the people who would teach those sections would be graduate students in philosophy or literature or whatever, and they would be paid to do that, and that would be part of their graduate fellowship 
support. So I think that's the way that it's usually done uh, here when it works well, but it's not, it's not ideal. It would be nice if the professors could have only 20 people. At the University of Chicago, we try to make classes as small as they can be, but that's not always possible. And I think I actually like lecturing to three, 400 people because I find it, it's an exciting theatrical performance. I can really perform my emotions about the text but then you got to have the smaller sections and you've got to have people who are writing comments on the papers. So that's the only way, I think, that that large course can really work. Thank you. We have another question from the people that are watching us over the internet. Could analyzing science and technology development be a good point to foster a humanistic approach in an undergraduate curriculum? Ah, yes. Now, I think if you are in a science faculty and your students are primarily scientists, then raising ethical issues that connect to scientific and technological development is a very good way to get them thinking in a course on critical thinking in particular. And there are. I mean, I've seen a lot of very good courses of this kind. Science and Human Values is one course that Notre Dame University in Indiana has that's a really wonderful course. And it's so popular that, in fact, you can't even get into it. And students are lining up to get into it. So I think those kinds of courses are really great. Uh, any kind of critical thinking course needs a subject matter. It can't just be, let's learn the rules of logic. So one natural subject matter will be political decision making or political choices. But if you're in science, yes, the intersection between science and human values is very important too. Uh, and I should add that I think everyone should learn to think about the ethical issues connected with economic development, with globalization, with the economic policies of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. So no matter whether they're scientists or humanists, they should all have that, that part of science, which affects absolutely every person's life in this world, should be absolutely front and center in, in the courses that they're taking. Thank you. Another question from Mexico City. Sometimes it is the religion itself that someone holds what constitutes the main barrier or obstacle for that person to approach the study of other religions. In a university, how can we deal with this issue? Well, I think very often people are worried, especially parents are worried, that when their young people learn about other religions, that will weaken their attachment to their own. Um, I don't actually think that's true. I think what usually happens is that people understand their own better by seeing it in contrast, and they understand it in a more reasoned, thoughtful way. Um, but I think what you can say to such a parent is, you know, first of all, we're just asking you to understand other religions. We're not asking you to endorse their thought, or we're not asking you at all to join that religion. But we're asking understanding because we think it's very important for citizenship in the modern world. Whatever your religion is and whatever it tells you about other religions, we all have to live together. And we all have to live together on terms of mutual respect and some attempt at understanding. It's very unlikely that that respect and that understanding will be achieved in a climate of absolute ignorance. I mean, let's take Islam. Most Americans in the US think that they think Islam is somehow violent, that it's connected with terrorism, and that it's connected with the oppression of women. Well, all of this, of course, is just a bunch of ignorant cliches. And if a student doesn't have a course that really studies Islam and the differences of interpretation within the tradition, the different kinds of Islamic uh, nations that have come into being in the modern period, well, then they, it's not like they'll know nothing, but they'll know the stupid cliches instead of nothing. And so the only alternative to stupid cliches is real learning and real understanding. So I think that's what you say to that parent. Now, in the US, there was one actually very interesting Supreme Court case where a Baptist mother from Tennessee said she didn't want her children learning about other religions and ways of life because she thought the truths contained in the Bible were all they needed to know for a good life. And, um, you know, that's not unreasonable position given the religion that she held, which was an evangelical form of Christianity. But what the court said is, well, 
That's all very well, but we are a pluralistic society where we need to talk together. And it's reasonable for the schools to acquaint students with the things they need to know in order to be good citizens and to talk together. So I think that's what you, you need to say to such parents, that even if their children know their own religion and are secure in it, that's not the end of what their duty is as a citizen. Their duty is to try to talk well to other people. And especially in this today's world, where there's so much misinformation about Islam particularly, but also about Hinduism, about uh, Judaism, about all, all the religions are objects of misunderstanding, then I think we have very strong reasons to learn and, and try to think complexly and well about other religions. Thank you. Another question. What does a person need to move from the emotional to the action level when confronted with human suffering? I mean, to feel responsible of taking action to change the unjust situation? Well, you know, there is some research about this, and a man named Daniel Batson in the University of Kansas has done some very interesting studies about the connection between the emotion of compassion and action that relieves the suffering. What he's found is that when there's something that it's very easy for the person to do and there's no impediment, then if you can get a person to feel sympathy by giving them a vivid story about somebody suffering, they actually will go out and do that. So, you know, they'll tell a story about some poor student who's broken her leg and she can't get to class and you have a car and it's very easy for you to drive the student to class. Usually they'll actually do that. So it looks like the problem is not so much with human beings and their compassion, which, which works quite well, but with the many things that step between the compassion and the action. I mean, for example, if the person's not a student at University of Kansas, but suppose the suffering person is way over there in India, well, then they have no idea what they can do in order to help. It all just seems too bewildering. There's so many people who are hungry, and I only have a little bit of money, so what am I supposed to do? And so I think for that reason, you also need good institutions, both at the national level and at the global level. If you think about a nation, if we were supposed to relieve poverty by voluntary compassion alone, that would be terrible. We know that from the Victorian era when that's all we had. And uh, then what happened is that people help the people they liked. They didn't help the people they didn't like. They talked about the deserving poor and the undeserving poor. And sometimes they were just so confused about who to give to that they didn't do anything at all. What helps is a good tax system that actually take some of your money and distributes it fairly to everyone. And then you don't have to think, how shall I do it? So I guess I think on the global level, we ultimately we need good institutions that will do that. It's much harder to think what those institutions will look like than, than it is in the nation case, because I don't really think we want a world state. But we want actually nations to just resolve to give much more of their money in aid to poorer nations than they now do. So that's something I'm actually writing about now. Um, but yeah, so I think human beings are, their compassion works pretty well in a narrow and familiar setting. And what makes trouble is when it starts getting distant and their large numbers are involved. And then even worse, when it's somebody that's a stranger and is threatening or frightening to you. And then, you you know, that just, it's like an electrical impulse that short circuits the compassion. And suddenly you think, oh, well, I don't owe anything to that person because that person actually frightens me. So that's one more reason why we need good institutions that are going to make compassion do its work fairly. Thank you. And do we have time for another question? Do you think universities have a responsibility to include the issue of animal rights and suffering? Or is this something that should be left for those particular groups that are concerned with this? In other words, should animal rights be a universal concern? Well, that's an issue that's actually very very dear to my heart. And um, I've just uh, co-edited with my partner, Cass Sunstein, a book on animal rights, which I hope some of you may take a look at. And I hope it will be translated into Spanish. Uh, but anyway, I think the answer to your question is definitely yes. 
Now, of course, some groups are, are more concerned with that than others. But any human being who, you know, eats meat or wears leather or wears fur, you're involved in this culture in which animals are being tortured. And so you better learn to know about that. I think that we can at least promote responsible choice. And the fact is that when people really know how animals are treated in the factory farming food industry, you know, when they know the conditions under which chickens and calves and pigs and so on are raised, then they're horrified and they want it to change. And right now in our law school, we're working out a consumer choice program where we're promoting a label that will tell consumers how the meat has actually been, how the animals that are being used for meat, how they've been treated during their lifetime. Then the consumer has a choice. They can pay more for the humane treatment or they pay less for the torture. Well, my bet is that when that information is out there and when you can't avoid knowing what you're eating, then people will make the ethical choice. At any rate, a lot more people will, and then it won't even be so costly to make it. And so gradually, gradually, more and more people will make the ethical choice as it becomes less costly. We have a supermarket chain here called Whole Foods, which does have ethical inspection. You know, and they, they don't buy meat from any place that treats animals badly. Well, I mean, of course, you might think that all treatment of animals for food is bad. But in, in any case, they hold up very high standards of humane treatment. So if you go to Whole Foods, you pay more, but you know you're participating in an, a more ethical system. And the tremendous popularity of that food chain is, I think, the most heartening thing I've seen. It shows you that when people have the choice, they really have the choice, then they will pay more for something that uh, attains a higher ethical standard. So I, yeah, I think these things should be part of an undergraduate curriculum because on the whole, people don't know these facts and when they do know them, then they actually do change. Hi, I, wa I want to make a question for you. Um, in the United States, you have a strong experience of uh, strong institutions, but in Mexico, we don't have it. How to deal with the challenge of make strong institutions in Mexico, for example, and, and to deal with this point of view of a new education uh, that promotes uh, liberty, um, human rights, um, the, s the concept of cit citizenship. Uh, I, I don't see how to work that point of view here in Mexico. What do you think about that? Well, you know, I, I think this problem is familiar to me from the development work that I do in India. And in India, too, uh, there's a sense that the institutional level is quite weak and a lot of it is corrupt. And so when women want change, they don't turn to the lawyers the way they might hear. And, you know, women in the United States have gotten most of the changes they've gotten through legal change, change in the rape law, change in all kinds of laws relating to women's equality. But in India, they say, oh, well, that doesn't mean anything because they think even if the law changes, it wouldn't be enforced or somebody would be corrupt and take the money and so on. Uh, so, you know, in that circumstance, I think you do need to keep working for stronger institutions, but you also need to act through non-governmental organizations, through the civil society sector. And um, in India, certainly a lot of the progress that women have made, they've gotten through the NGO sector. There are just thousands of NGOs all over India that are doing education, microcredit, all the other things that need to be done. And so I think that's where you, you can certainly turn in that direction. But I think you're not even going to get there if you don't focus first on education, on making people aware of the issues that need to be changed, and cultivating the faculties of sympathy and also of anger, anger protesting against injustice that are necessary to bring about uh, good action in civil society, but also ultimately to bring about and sustain institutional change. And I would say, you know, to give India as an example again, through this tireless 
working in NGOs on the question of education in rural areas and education for women, uh, gradually even political mobilization eventually took place. And two years ago, India put into the basic rights section of its constitution a guarantee, which can be legally enforced, that all children will have free compulsory primary and secondary education up to uh, the 12th grade of school. Now that's actually being enforced to some extent anyway. I mean, there are many, many problems. But in other words, the public will was created through the NGO sector and through higher education that focuses on women's issues, departments of women's studies particularly. And then that led to political mobilization, which in turn led to the legal and institutional change. So I think no reason why something like that uh, couldn't happen elsewhere also. You spoke before about the movement from um, emotions to actions. I wonder if you could elaborate in the movement that I would say from what you are proposing for universities, that means critical thinking and awareness of global citizenship and the development of imagination, how to move from that to norms and legislation. Well, I think... Um, you know, the first thing, the first step is to try to get people to have a good debate about these issues. And that's really what higher education can supply. It supplies a rich range of alternatives and enough knowledge and sympathy behind them that the debate unfolds in a reasonable and informed way. And so let's suppose we're talking now, I'll just pick some example about the treatment of criminals or the problem of criminal justice in our society. And I pick that because in the US, I think that's one of our biggest problems. Well, then in education, you want to start thinking well about race and the connection between the criminal justice system and racism. And so if you have a general course that acquaints you with the history of racial problems in your society, that's a first step in being an informed participant in debates about racial profiling in criminal justice, or the, the tremendous disproportionate population of African Americans who are in our horrible, disgusting prisons. So, uh, you know, that kind of basic information then leads to a richer debate. And instead of just seeing African Americans as troublemakers who might as well be in jail, almost before they've done anything, right? Then you, uh, you get a richer debate, and then the people themselves can come forward. The people who are most affected can come forward and be leading participants in that debate and uh, take the lead in pressing for certain kinds of legal change. I think the, the women's movement in the United States had very much that shape also, that, that there was, first of all, a general growth of awareness. There was consciousness raising, which was very much fostered by higher education. And then there was uh, specific sorts of proposals for legal change. Uh, so, you know, these things are often slow. And I think it helps to have your eye fixed on three or four very specific things that you'd like to accomplish, first of all, and, you know, work for those things. And then you feel like you've accomplished something in the way that the women's movement in the United States fixed on the law regarding rape and the fact that a raped woman's sexual history was admissible in court and so on. So they picked on these specific things that they wanted to change and they kept working on that. And then they, having done something on that, then they moved on to sexual harassment in the workplace and they work on that. So that if, you, if you have an agenda that's very concrete, then I think you can harness it to your liberal education in a way that leads to concrete action so that you feel you're actually doing something and people don't give up in despair thinking, oh, it's all too hopeless, there's too much that needs to be changed. But they feel, no, I've, I've done my little bit here, now let's move on to the next issue. Thank you. We have a question from Mexico City and it says, Professor Nuzman, what is your personal definition of ethics? Uh, well, um, you know, the first thing is I want to say that I would want to make a separation between ethical thinking and political thinking because I think that ethical thinking in a pluralistic society is very diverse. And so my personal definition would include some thinking about 
my own Aristotelian background. It would also include thinking about the fact that I'm Jewish and I have that religion. But I wouldn't think that my fellow citizens should all share that. Um, so, you know, the political sphere is the sphere where we reason together and we try to get principles that we can believe in together. And therefore, we don't want to bring into that sphere our own very particular and very personal attachments if we think that our fellow citizens can't be expected to share them. This was brought out very nicely by the people who framed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Jacques Maritain, the great Catholic philosopher who worked on the Universal Declaration, said that, you know, as a Catholic, I think of issues of human rights in terms of the idea of the soul. But of course, I don't want to bring the idea of the soul into a cross-cultural debate that's trying to set up some basic human rights documents because other religions have different ideas of the person. So instead, says Maritain, I'm going to talk about human dignity and the human person, but I'm not going to talk about the soul or the life after death or God and so on. So you know, when you ask me the question about my personal definition, uh, that's why I want to answer you in this complicated way, because there would be things in my personal definition, things having to do with specifically Jewish beliefs or beliefs about God and so on, that I you know, want to keep to myself. I don't want to put them in, into the political debate. And I think in the political debate, what the ethical principles that I think of as very fundamental and shareable by all uh, I would start with the idea of human dignity, the dignity of each and every human being. And I would start with the idea that that dignity is equal, that we're all equals, and that we want political principles by which we can live together as equals and live a life that's worthy of the dignity of the human being. Now then, I would go on to say, well, what do people need if they are to have a life with human dignity, and that's where my list of the 10 capabilities comes in. But all of that is, is political and not, um, not just personal. It, it's what I think all people in a pluralistic society ought to be able to share. If I'm bringing up my own child, I'll include some other stuff. I'll send her to temple and give her a bat mitzvah and so on. But I think it's important to preserve that distinction between the personal ethics and the political ethics because we do have to live together and we don't want all the time to be bringing everything from our personal religion into the public square because we might meet somebody there who can't accept our religion, but we still want to live on terms of equality and respect with that person. Thank you. We have another question from Campus Chiapas. Professor Nussbaum, in a world ruled by globalization, functionalism, technology, and market loss, do you really believe there is a hope for the human spirit? Well, first of all, I wouldn't quite think the world is ruled by uh, globalization. I mean, there's a baneful aspect of globalization, which is the loss of human values, the loss of the idea that this is really people we're dealing with. I don't think we're there yet. I think that the very success of the human development reports of the United Nations Development Program, in which I've been a participant, and the whole human development approach to uh, international development shows that people are hungry for a more humanistic, more rich approach to development that does see human beings as human beings, not just as instruments for gain. So while I think that economic globalization exerts some pressures that need to be watched carefully and need to be resisted, I also think that it hasn't yet made us lose the human spirit. Even at the World Bank, I can tell you that capabilities and the human development approach are very, very much respected and are talked about. And so I think um, we really need to keep bringing in the humanistic discourse into the realm of economics, and we need to keep uh, insisting that we don't just want to think about maximizing profit or maximizing GNP per capita. We want to measure development along this richer set of human parameters. And in order to get people who will go on and will go into the debate and insist on that, I think we need humanistic higher education. Thank you. Professor Nussbaum, we thank you for these insightful and enrichment ideas. Professor Ignace Sainz, well, I'll you. give the, micro the microphone to you. 
Thank you very much. I, I really want to thank you for your wonderful questions and uh, to say that I'm very uh, impressed by the process you're going through of rethinking your curriculum. And I'm excited about what you're doing. I hope I can talk to you in the future sometime. And I just want to wish all of you the, the very, very best in this extremely important endeavor to all faculty, all administrators, and all students.